Hello, welcome to the Research Cat. In today's video, we're going to be looking at organizing and preparing an efficient uh, method for creating a five paragraph essay, which is the foundation block for a research report. Not really looking at a research study like we looked at last week, we're not really looking at how we might go about and going to acquire the information and locating it since that was covered in last week's video how to research how to read a research study instead this is going to be focused on getting started now this is really aimed at the first and second year or community college level of classes that doesn't mean that high school later high school and later in the university won't use the same building blocks but this is really aimed at the writing and coursework of those particular um, classes part of the reason i've chosen those two years is because i have experience at teaching those two years in multiple schools in new york so i'm relatively familiar with that curriculum um, as is generally shown in a narrative essay and a persuasive essay, both based on facts that have been researched. The five paragraph essay is generally considered the foundation because later on, even if you get up into 100 page or 150 page dissertations, you're still using the basic principles that I have clear transitions, I have clear topic sentences, I have a clear thesis. The difference is that in a 200 page paper, your thesis may be an entire paragraph. And we'll address that a little bit later when we get into more into the research studies. I wanted to first start with just looking at a blank page and getting started. When we're starting on a blank page, one of the first things that I generally have students do is come over to their ruler and make sure that their ruler is actually turned on. You can find it under the View tab up on the ribbon. If for some reason you do not see your ribbon, come over to the Home tab and right next to whatever is the last one of your tabs you'll notice mine are a little different than perhaps you have you can right click on that my recording software is causing an issue and you'll come up with this which will be you can collapse the ribbon or uncollapse the ribbon doesn't really matter which way you happen to work with it Now, I like to work with mine unclapsed. Some people prefer to have this ribbon hidden and that gives them a little more space, uh, particularly on a smaller screen. I happen to work off of a pretty large monitor, so it's not really such a problem for me. Generally speaking, you will not have these three and they're not in the defaults. Acrobat was added through the Creative Cloud, Grammarly, um, is a service that I pay for to uh, clean up my writing because I typically write very fast and I write quite a bit each day and so it keeps me from making stupid mistakes by misspelling words that I really should know better on and EndNote is the software we looked at last time for organizing uh, research which is this window here Now, the first thing that I do when I get started on a paper and I'm faced with the blank paper, and sometimes students get intimidated by the idea that they have to write this 800 word paper and they start with nothing, is to just write down, don't worry about formatting or anything, just write down first what the topic is that I'm going to do. So perhaps the first topic that I'm going to look at is gamification. So I put gamification down, I go over onto Google Scholar or I go over onto um, 
ProQuest and I say, put in gamification, I'm going to come up with millions of answers because the topic is too big. It is actually easier to write on a topic that is narrowed down and small because if I was to write gamification and do a good treatment of gamification, I'm going to end up in hundreds of pages. So instead, I'm going to do gamification um, in the freshman university classes. And I might go up, go back out into my libraries and look for that particular topic. The problem there is I'm still going to end up way too large. So now what I need to do is I need to narrow it down. So I'm going to go with freshman medical school classes. in college. And that is likely to bring a more narrowed focus. That is the scope. The scope is how much you're going to cover. If I pick a, too to a topic that is too large, either my, and my scope then is too broad, I'm either going to end up with very uh, a trite treatment of it people will say, well, I haven't really learned anything new because you didn't have the time to go in depth. Or you pick a narrow scope, but you can now go a little deeper into the writing. Whether you're doing a narrative essay or a persuasive essay, you're basing it on facts that are out there. And so you want to have this sentence, which is going to become the thesis. It's not the thesis right now, and it doesn't have to be. Once I have that set up, then I can start setting up on how to write a paper. And in the beginning here, um, I'm going to start with a introduction of some sort. Now before I do the introduction I'm going to have the title of the paper. Now I am not very good at creative titles so I'm going to start with something very basic and I'm going to center it. That's on the home tab above paragraph and I'm going to um, a lot of people I see bold it. You really don't want to bold this in a traditional APA. Now, in reality, I would have a move all of this down to the second page. And the first page is traditionally going to be right in the middle of the page. Um, typically, my name, the title, Usually it's the course name or the professor that's teaching it. And then sometimes you might put in the school. And so I would fill that information out for however I want and I would make sure that it's down at the center of the page. The yellow that, you're, that, is, that you'll see sometime is actually the recording software uh, because it's anxious to make it a full screen but we're actually not going to do that, so it will have to survive. And then up here, if you would just select this, please, thank you. And then we're going to come up to the top, oops, and down. So now I have my first page, which is the cover sheet, and then you're going to come down onto this one. Typically at this level of schooling, you're going to find that your instructor should give you a pretty good idea of what you're going to do. If they say it's APA or Chicago or MLA, and you're not really sure where to go for that, I'll put a link in the uh, bottom for uh, Purdue University, which has a pretty good writing lab and goes over how to set up 
um, a basic sonnet. Um, I typically write in APA 6th edition, although I've published in Chicago style and I'm familiar with MLA. So as you become more familiar, it's just a matter of changing around um, the actual style. The styles themselves all follow the same basic principle of I'm going to make a statement and I have to have some sort of a backing for that statement. I have evidence that I'm introducing for what that statement is. There's very little common knowledge, which is the things that I don't have to reference. Anything that I used as reference material should be um, cited inside of your paper. Now, there's different ways to set it up. Traditionally, what I will do is I will figure out first my thesis statement, and then I will write a sentence that is going to become my topic sentence. And in this case, I might have a topic sentence that um, freshman medical classes um, use, uh, let me see, this is always the problem with making things off the top of the head. Um, use games to simulate uh, office uh, procedures. And then I might have another one which are games are used, I spelled games wrong, I'll come back and fix that. I was writing too fast. Games are uh, used to enhance learning. And then I'm going to have one more uh, topic sentence in your traditional five paragraph essay. And this one is going to be, I'll do it on games. Um, are used to give um, experience to students in lab procedures. Now, one thing that you're going to see is that I don't have corrections being given right now as I'm going, and that's because I have not actually opened the Grammarly yet. Typically, I'll put down and start writing and organizing the paper, and then I turn Grammarly on once I begin to fill it out. The other thing is that the spacing is pretty weird at this point. So I can hit Control A on the keyboard. It will select everything, come up to Paragraph, Indents and Spacing, which is the first tab, go to Double Space, because that's traditionally what you're going to use, and Don't Add Space and then click OK, and it's going to be set up. Now I have to go back up to the top of my paper. And center it. And it looks like it's done something weird. It has. OK. I can always check my spacing by coming over here. And this will show every place that I have an enter. And that's also on the home tab. That's your show a hide paragraph marks. It also shows some other um, other markups that you might have used in the paper. Now your thesis for your paper is traditionally the last sentence of your first paragraph. So I may do an introduction to how medical school classes in college are using gamification. And either I'll cite two or three different sources, or depending on the type of paper that I'm writing, um, what motivated me to do this. And then once I have that together, I'm going to then end up with the thesis statements, 
And now these will be fleshed out to actual sentences. And then filling in the information for it. Now, the reason that I do this is because I do not want to write out my paper as a draft and then go back and rewrite the entire paper again. I, I just don't have that much time. Um, it's not a bad way to do it when you're first learning to write your papers. But um, for instance, in my second and third year of my doctorate, the traditional weekly papers were around 20 pages per week. And that was only for one class and I was taking four classes. And if I'm writing 80 pages of paper plus going to work, I simply don't have the time necessary to write out um, a framework and then go back and rewrite it again. So I came on this idea of I'm just going to put the paper paper directly in and then I can use cut and paste or I can use insert commands and make the paper so that it's much easier to write. Now if you're doing a longer paper these thesis statements will then typically become something like um, sections of the paper. They'll become headers essentially and headers would be bold and I would center it in the middle. Um, and they're just a little piece of a sentence. They're not a major sentence in themselves. So this would become enhanced learning. And I'm gonna make this one bold. And down here, um, I do lab procedures. Now, as I said in the beginning, your five paragraph paper is generally a good start for what longer papers that you write later on in school would look like. And this is true in that the topic sentences become now your headers. And under there, I'll have two or three paragraphs, and it becomes kind of clunky in a larger academic paper to do long transitions to very clearly organize that somebody is looking, they're looking at freshman medical classes all under gamification, so they come into the first part, where they're looking and they're only interested in the enhanced learning portion. So then they go to that stage of gamification or they're interested in only the lab procedures. So they go into just that part. It allows to skim through so you're not having to read through 20 pages of text to get to the part that you are in particular interested in. You're going to also have a conclusion down at the end and that conclusion is going to be a summary or restatement of the first paragraph. It's not just the thesis but also you want to give them either the reader something to think about or you want to add a little bit of extra information but generally you don't want the conclusion to be limited to just the paper. You want to have some, um, I call it a hook, at the end that makes people want to read more about your paper. Now after I have all the information put in, then I start worrying about format. I don't really worry about format in the beginning of the paper. Um, I used to teach web um, and HTML and I would have students that would be so interested in making the website look pretty that they never got to the content portion. So instead, do your content portion. Get all of your work that is in there. And once that I have all of my work in there, including a works cited page or a reference page or a bibliography, then what I'm going to do is 
put it into the format that is needed. And that's when I'm going to make it look good. I'm going to go back in and check my spaces. I'm going to make sure I have hanging indents where they need to be. Um, if you're not familiar with a hanging indent, I can show you that now. And we'll go over and we'll grab something from here. I'll take this uh, paper on IT, put it over into my document with a paste. And in here, I want to make this into Times New Roman, 12 point. And a hanging indent, if I put my cursor anywhere in this paragraph, and I can always find a paragraph by going to the paragraph markup. I'm going to come up and grab the lower, these are like little teeth they look to me, like little canines hitting together. And so I'm going to go to the one that says hanging indent, not left indent. And I'm going to drag it over into this area. This will give me now a hanging indent for this particular article. And then you have to make sure not to grab the box and you can reset it back to where it needs to be. But for most uh, works cited, you're going to grab just the hanging indent one and move it over to the tab space. The other thing to watch that I see students do sometimes is instead of using a tab to move over, which should move you to this first line, right, the half inch in, they'll try to space it out and it doesn't really work that well if you do it that way. So if I go in five spaces, I'm still not really there. And so I'm going to want to come directly over here where I just set up this markup and then for the tab. So you really want to make sure that you have, and if I turn on this and I say, well, I see where they did their spaces and then they did their tab, you've made life much harder for yourself and your paragraphs aren't going to be aligned correctly in the beginning. So you should always use a tab to push you inwards to the half inch margin. And that's how the tab moves, by the way. If you look at your tab, it's going to move half inch, half inch, half inch. That's how your tab works. If I need to move farther down the line, I would set up a paragraph markup and then that would allow me to move to a custom uh, spacing. At this moment we don't really need that and I'm just putting in the information. Now once I have the information I want to organize it. So for the purposes of not writing an entire fake paper that I don't need, I'm going to come over to I'm going to actually close this window. Um, don't save it. And I'm going to come over to a paper that I wrote. This one has, this one's from my master's. It's a 500 level course. And I blanked out the teacher's name because I don't have their permission. It's an APA, so it's running head with the page numbers. And the reason you want to have some sort of a head is you want to show which of your papers goes together in the order. Don't make somebody try to put a puzzle together which sentence belongs on which one. Sometimes it's you and you might not want to do it. So this had to do with management coaching. This is the introduction up here. And it gives a little bit overview, a paragraph, four to five sentences on what is the coaching industry in the United States in 2011. The reason it's red underneath is because Word doesn't like that spelling. That's fine um, that Word doesn't like the spelling because those are people's names and it just doesn't recognize them. Now, the other thing that you might need to look at is how long a paragraph is. The typical rule is it's four to five sentences, but that is by no means a hard and fast rule. 
A paragraph is as long as the theme is needed. In academic papers, you traditionally want between five, uh, four to five sentences. If you have a single sentence, and it can happen, it's because it's emphasizing something and it's pretty unusual. So you have to have a reason to justify it other than it looks good or that's all you could find because that probably isn't going to be good enough. Your last sentence of the first paragraph is traditionally your thesis and that's what's going to break down the rest of the paper. And this one, this is a five paragraph essay. So I have a thesis, which is down here. The cognitive approach affects three areas in today's educational climate skills coaching, performance coaching, and life coaching, and then the page number that follows in from this one reference. Now, in this particular approach, and this is the approach that I like to use in my five paragraph essays, is that you have your introduction. The thesis breaks down the three topic sentences. There's going to be a topic sentence on skills coaching, one on performance coaching, and one on life coaching. Then I have a new reference here. Now, I have a paragraph that is here that is defining what cognitive coaching is. And if you have a um, paper that you're doing a specific model or type that is technical language or language that people aren't usually used to, you might have terms in that before you get started on your basic paper so that everyone is able to understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about cognitive coaching, which is both supervisory and peer coaching. After I've covered that, and that's only three sentences, it's pretty short, then I'm going to introduce skills coaching, which was our first of the topics. This is then the author, it gives the citation afterwards, and then it talks about various um, aspects of skills coaching. Then we're going to real world education coaches, and then we're doing uh, commonality in coaching effectively, which is life skills coaching. Um, I have more experience with writing now, so I'm much more likely to have said in order for elements to be uniformly strong, there needs to be the challenge of life skills so that it's up here in the front part um, rather than a couple sentences down in. It's just not as clear. And then I'm going to have a Addressing here, I addressed a framework or review of how we could look at those coaches, and then I have the summary. So this one is seven paragraphs, but it follows the five paragraph plan that you're going to have your introduction, you're going to have, I have a um, some sort of a definition first, and then you have your three topics, and then I have a framework at the end. That framework part was unique to this class um, since this was a class that was specific to being able to coach students. So this would be one. Every time I used some sort of reference, I have to put the date down so that somebody can find it down at the end, and then we have this references down at the end um, on how many references there are. As the references list becomes larger, and it will become larger as you move further up into your education. One of the mistakes sometimes that I see students do is they'll look at in their freshman year, they'll look at what they're expected to do at their master's or their doctorate levels, and they're like, I can't do that. And they give up at that point. By the time you get up to where you are looking at in um, your master's or your doctorate, you'll be ready for it. It's just like your math book. If you first open up your math book and you flip to the end and you say, I can't do this, no, because you haven't done the foundation work for it yet. In actual fact, I have found that 
as you move further up in education, you're going to find it more interesting because you've gotten off of the foundation courses and now you get to go directly into what you want. So in this course was a foundation uh, course of the masters on how to set up uh, what the coaching industry was in management. And we were looking at specifically educational management for students. But if we went over to this other paper, um, in this particular course, I was, and it actually occurred later in my education, this was that we were given a task of creating a coaching class for a topic that we did not know. Um, I did not know anything about swimming and setting up a swimming lifeguarding course. I know how to swim, but I wasn't sure how you'd set up the certification schedule. This paper was a lot more fun, and yet, um, it's actually longer, and it didn't use as many references. It didn't use as many references because the foundation work had already been covered earlier. In this particular course, instead of having uh, topic sentences, I have the headers. And the headers are there because there's multiple pages and figures underneath each header um, for this. So it gives you a example of two different ways to do it. Um, I can't help but find errors, I guess, in my work and correct them as I'm, <laughs> as I'm going through. So this would be a different type of a uh, paper, but this is also at the master's level where these two papers, one was, this is the work on what is a life coaching, and then the second one, which would be the equivalent of a persuasive essay, um, at a little higher up in the in the educational track is this is likely what one would do so in this particular paper in my topic sentence I have um, the evaluation should be chosen based upon whether the assessments are hinged upon making a decision or measuring an objective um, knowing what I do now, I should probably have put in the evaluation should likely be chosen because there may be another option in there that I did not account for. And then there's another paragraph down here that explains so that we have the criteria. At this point in my education of my master's um, on adult education, I was very interested in, and still am to a certain extent, on how tests are being uh, configured. Um, sometimes what happens is students will take tests and the information on the test is actually only measuring that particular test. It's not measuring the breadth of a student's knowledge. Personally, as an instructor, I like to give essay tests. Students do better on them because with an essay test, a student is telling me what I um, don't know. They're, or rather, they're telling me what they know, um, which may be information that I'm not aware of. And that's why they need to cite their sources. Uh, particularly if I'm teaching a group class, um, I taught uh, electronic students and I'm not really that versed in computer electronics on what goes on in a circuit board. And those were very fascinating uh, papers to read because it expanded my knowledge of that paper. So I was quite interested in that. And the students found that it really wasn't that bad to write. Um, a lot of students like multiple choice, but in multiple choice, the tests, they're easier on the teacher to, to do. And there is a spot for multiple choice in testing, but multiple choice tests are generally testing, um, do you know what I'm going to put on the test? 
and that's not as useful to me. It doesn't test the breadth of what that student might have learned. So I prefer um, essays. As you get further into your college, it's generally um, accepted that you're going to be doing more and more essays. I have a couple of math essays that we might look at later um, when I look at quantitative research that there are math papers that it's not enough to be able to solve the problem. I have to be able to explain to the company or to the contractor who hired me how I arrived at that problem and what was the criteria that I used to measure that whatever that outcome was. So just filling out an answer and saying, well, the answer is 42 is worthless. Um, and it would not get me hired anywhere. So let's go back to, let's, well, on the, this one, up at the top where I've talked about the ruler, you're going to see that there is multiple markups. Those multiple markups are, exist because of this table. Um, I wanted to make sure that things lined up correctly in the table. And so that's what those markups are used, is inside of this table. Um, the other thing is that in a paper like this, um, these parts here should actually have been into the center. Um, for the headers, that would have been more correct, and this one actually was there. Um, I'm fairly confident that this paper got an A. Most of my papers got A's. Um, but that doesn't mean that looking at your work as a um, even my master's and bachelor's work as a, uh, a doctor, I look at it and go, man, I can't believe I wrote that. And that's actually a positive thing uh, because it actually shows how much I've improved inside. Now, this paper looks pretty good. Word doesn't really have a problem with it. There's not a lot of blue lines. There's a blue line here for grammar. Most likely they want a hyphen there. Um, and there's a blue line here from hyphens. But if the paper that I'm citing did not have a hyphen and talk about long term in a hyphen, I typically didn't do that. But if I was to open Grammarly, I'm going to fill it with 59 issues. That doesn't mean that every issue is a problem that needs to be fixed. In this particular case, the sentence is too long. And so when I come over here, it'll give me a hard to uh, read sentence. I don't know that I would change it. The reason the sentence is too long is mostly because of this part here, which is the citation and it needs to be there. So I don't know that I would actually change that in this case. This part is a um, tautology. And if I wanted to know more about that, my uh, recording software is sitting over it. Let me bring this over a bit. And you can click into here and a tautology just because there's a little button here that I can't reach on the side of my screen at the moment. But that tautology means I'm saying two things. I have $2 billion with the dollar sign, which means I've said the same thing. If I was to say a sentence and say, I personally like, well, I don't need the word personally because I already am referring to it in first person with I. Or if I'm going to use, and I believe this is uh, one of their examples from Grammarly is, the color red. I don't need to say it's the color red because red is the color. So I'm giving useless information, making my sentence more complicated, but not gaining anything on it. Now, um, I've been using Grammarly for a few years. In reality, I found that the free version of Grammarly was not any better than Word. Um, the paid version of Grammarly is considerably better because it can uh, fix a whole lot of issues such as 
Um, up inside of Grammarly, I might say adjust my goals. And this is a goal based on the audience. So is this somebody who is knowledgeable? And based on what they're picking up types, they're saying that in this. Perhaps I wanna say it's an academic. And so when I come over here and I put it into academic, I have 54 issues. Five of them have gone away because those were specific issues that would be in a business paper, but not with an academic paper. Um, by no means uh, is Grammarly the only source out there for doing it, but it certainly gave me um, a lot of help. When I first started in my master's, I had quite a bit of um, issues with making sure that my sentences were correct, specifically with passive writing. And I needed something that would be able to coach me and tell me not just that this is wrong, which Word does a pretty good job of, but why it is wrong and how I can fix it. And just over time, it's helped out in helping me out a lot. Um, there are certain words that I still struggle with sp uh, spelling with, and I feel like, man, I should really know this. Um, and yet, I don't always remember how to spell uh, certain words. And so since my livelihood now depends partially on spelling, uh, particularly with the various emails that I send and corrections to students, I found this was a good solution for it. Now, as we come down and you're writing in a paper such as this, there's going to be areas like this, which say coaching. And the prob problem is that, um, well, first of all, it wants the approach to the coaching needs because coaching is generally used not in the plural form, which is what I'm using it in here. So I would leave it here. But the other problem is that it's going to be repeated many times. But because this paper is on coaching, I'm not going to um, mess with that. But then there are other areas uh, such as, um, let me see, this. This is an unclear ante uh, antecedent. And basically this needed to get fixed. This is fine for, I guess, the masters, but it should have been what does this refer to? Typically, you go backwards to whatever the last topic is you're talking about, and I'm talking about various aspects in play. So really, this needs to be changed to become uh, different elements can make for a highly varied subject or a grouping of subjects to be challenging to apply to coaching effectively. This sentence just needs to be reworked. Now, I saved all of my essays that I did in school because this way I can bring them up and I may not use this particular essay again, other than now when I get to illustrate something with it, but um, I do get to uh, perhaps use it when I come across, if someone asks me to do research on coaching in management or education, I have somewhere to start from. And then I can take this paper and rewrite it or take a section of it or maybe update the information. But I have a starting point that I can then use. And so I found that to be useful uh, in order to organize the papers. I would suggest for people that are in their first and second year that you do not have to write your essays from start to finish. If you block it out and you know that these are the topics that you want to do, then as you find the information, you can plug it into the paper. There's nothing wrong with doing it from first to last but sometimes you might be saving research and it can become disorganized, if, particularly if you're looking at 1,000 words, 1,200 words. If you're doing a simple paragraph, that's not really such a big issue.
because you probably only have one, maybe two sources. But as you start to look at seven, eight, nine, 10, 15 sources, it can become confusing. So one of the advantages with Word instead of the typewriter is I can simply say, well, I'm going to move this. And I hit Control X on the keyboard, and then I move it to wherever I want to move it to. In this case, you don't really want to move it. But if I was, I could just move it down someplace and then reorganize it once all the information is there. And then you also, if each time you put it, your information in, you can cite it at the bottom. And that will help you build up a citation. Now, some people use the references in Word, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can set up references, it'll set up your style, it'll set up the citation in it, and it will put in a block. Uh, I personally am not a big fan of this. I'm not a big fan of even EndNotes, um, and that's because I'm a control freak, and I like to make sure that I'm controlling uh, the information. I have mine set on autosave up above the home tab in uh, most of the words. You'll see there's an autosave. You can turn it on and off. Be aware that you have to be signed into a version to, to say that it's on so it knows where to sign it. To, to assign that particular save. But I'll save mine uh, each time I finish a paragraph and then I just hit Control S on the keyboard and it will save it. So there's little idiosyncrasies that we will develop as we, as you become more uh, capable of researching and being able to organize the information. Primarily, students worry too much about all these different parts, that, and it's just like the game um, that I'm doing over in the Let's Play. You don't have to learn all of Word all at once. You probably want to learn how to set up your text. Under your Paragraph tab, you probably want to know how to set up the space and make sure you add, don't add space between paragraphs of the same style. This has been a, and it will not keep this, even if I set it as a default um, for all documents on the normal template, I will come back to this next time I launch and it will still be off. This has been an error in Word since, I think since Word first came out. Um, I have hopes that someday they'll fix it in an update. You're probably going to want to know where your bold, italics, and underline is. You're going to want to know where your ruler is. And other than that, you everything else is extra. If you learn how to um, understand that red is spelling and blue is grammar, the underlines, the double blue underline is a grammar, the red is spelling, it will make your work faster, and it won't necessarily catch everything. Um, I had a student that turned off their spelling once and then told me that their spelling was perfect. And I was like, huh, yeah, no. Um, and I still marked them down when they had their spelling wrong. And they were kind of upset at that point. And I was like, well, turning off the spelling doesn't mean that the spelling is not um, that the spelling is perfect. It just means that you didn't want to see the spelling issues. So you're going to have to kind of decide and not everything that is said is a spelling issue. In this particular case, these are not spelling issues. And what we looked at before on the last paper, not all of those issues are sentence issues. So you're gonna to have to use your judgment a little bit, but it will certainly catch a lot of um, errors. And so one thing is that because my job depends on professional writing and that I send emails, even short emails out to um, someone else, I don't wanna be misspelling things um, because it either gives the person the impression that I don't care, which is not true, or that I don't know enough to change it, which is not true. 
Um, it's just that I was working fast. And so therefore having um, something to catch that helps out. Your five paragraph essay is going to have an introduction paragraph and typically a sentence at the bottom that in this particular one is this. It's a thesis followed by the citation. And then you're going to have topic sentences that follow along. If you're in something in a field that uses specific terminology and you're writing about that field, you might want to have a paragraph after it that goes through definitions or about criteria of evaluations or principles that are going to be used in the rest of the paragraph um, and in the rest of not just the paragraph and the rest of the paper. And then you're going to have your topic sentences. In this particular paper, I had a last paragraph before the summary that was the framework that would take those three areas and bring it down to talk about it in its components. Um, and that's because this was a paper that was being designed from the beginning for a final project that it feeds into. And then you're going to have a summary. The summary is um, talking about what are these components in here? And then we have the performance. So the first sentence deals with two major components to problem solving and self-reflection. And the second sentence deals with the same things of skills, performance, and life coaching worded a little different from the thesis. And then it expands upon that a little bit and then gives whatever the statement is that I want people to most remember. People will most remember the last statement that you said. So you want your strongest statement to generally be at the end of the paper. And that's really your same for your studies. Now, as an aside for this, if I was to do a study, I would still have an introduction, we know from last week. The studies are typically longer, and so they have a pocket paragraph where the thesis will be a couple of sentences. I'll have a sentence about this topic and a sentence about that topic, and those topics will become the headers. I'll have a literature review. This entire paper is essentially a literature review. I'll have a methodology section that this is how I'm going to conduct this study. I'll have a methods section and a tools section. This is the specific elements that are used in conducting that study. I'll have a data analysis section, um, which is here's the data that I collected along with a data collected section. And then I'm going to have a conclusion of this is what all of this means. Um, and I'm going to have a future resource. And that's the same for a dissertation, although a dissertation is very formal about that. So when you're learning your five paragraph essay, if you learn it well, you have the foundation for being able to do a um, research study and it will carry you through all the way to the end. So I personally prefer to help students get a really solid five paragraph essay um, in their first and second year so that they have that solid foundation for their continuing years as they continue up. If you choose not to continue up, that's fine. Many people, however, may say, well, I'm not going to continue to my bachelor's or master's or doctorate, and then they might change their mind. I, I did that. I did my associate degree and then I started my bachelor's. Um, various life things happened and I ended up not completing the bachelor's right away. I went off for seven years and ran my own business. Then I came back and finished my bachelor's and then said, you know, I think maybe I'll take a different turn. And I got a second associate degree um, as I finished the bachelor's and then a master's. And then after a few years, I said, you know, I think I really do want to do that. And then I got my doctorate. So you don't have to um, know in your first year freshman 
of college what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And I would argue that you probably actually can't do that because there's various things that occur in your lifetime that you can't plan for. Um, however, setting up a solid foundation for your writing is going to help you out no matter where you go. Um, and I would argue that the five paragraph essay is probably the way to start because it's going to have what a strong thesis is, which is narrow in scope. It's going to have your topic sentences and it's going to have how you've organized your research. And then I've just given you a little summary of some extra tools that I use to make my writing more efficient. Um, if this is something that you found useful, you can always give me a thumbs up or a like. If there's something about this that you have some questions about and you would like to know a little deeper into Word, just leave a comment at the bottom and I will uh, get to it and cover it. Otherwise, we're going to be doing one on coming up on critical thinking. And um, I also want to do one on Excel and being able to understand the the surface of Excel and getting started on Excel um, and understanding how the equations work and what the purpose of Excel is inside of the Microsoft Office. And once you're Microsoft Office, once you become more familiar with it, the programs work together. The mailings, for instance, does have, if I went into mailings, I could have a um, and put in a table right into this. But I can also work in Access and bring Access into this one to set up a mail merge that way. And I can do the same with Excel and bring Excel into here as more uh, tables, but the tables won't necessarily work um, in that for the calculations. So there's a lot of different options that you have and I just wanted to do a quick summary of it. If you have any further questions, please uh, feel free to leave me a message below or you can send me an email um, to theresearchcat at gmail.com and take care.